Yes. Okay, welcome to the second session, which will be about grammar. The first talk, uh, speaker will be Maria Angelos Gallego, also known as Maritel, from the Consejo Superior de Investigación Científica in Madrid. I'm sure most people know of her work and grammar, both Karite and Rabbinite grammar. She's cooperated with Jeffrey Kahn and others here uh, in some of the publication of Karite gra grammatical texts. And she'll be talking about language use, language attitudes among the Karites. Thank you. Well, in the first place, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this event, uh, Professor Daniel Lasker, also Benjamin Nasher, and all the people who have collaborated. It is uh, a wonderful location. And uh, I can tell already <clears throat> from this morning that it's going to be a very exciting event. Thank you very much. And also to the donors who have made it possible. Um, well, uh, in Spain, the situation about carry studies is as follows. There are three of us, basically, uh, who can do some work. Uh, and as far as I know, there is no doctorate student doing any work on carides. Uh, Professor Daniel Lasker knows very well uh, Spanish scholarship, so tell me if I make any mistake, but uh, <laughs> uh, apart from Carlos del Valle, uh, Jose Martinez Delgado, and myself, uh, there are no other uh, scholars dealing with Karaites. And, um, well, in my case, I came to Karaites studies uh, uh, through uh, Judeo-Arabic and grammar, thanks to a contract that uh, Professor Jeffrey Kahn advertised in the na in, that I got. And um, I must say that I came to know about the Karais through the Geaya accent. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, <laughs> as you all know, uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey Kahn is a big fan of uh, the Hidayat al Kari and uh, theories about uh, accents. And uh, when I first went to Cambridge, and uh, Miriam Goldstein can, co can confirm because you were also in that seminar, uh, uh, the first word that I heard about Karais was basically, I think, the Geaya and all the accents that. <laughs> Uh, that seminar about uh, uh, in which we were reading um, Karai texts, in this case by Abul Faraj Harun. And uh, well, uh, I want to say a word also about the situation of uh, Karai studies because uh, in the context of Jewish studies in Spain, and uh, well, as in many parts of the world, it is going through uh, serious, uh, serious difficulties. And I wonder what uh, maybe there should be another seminar in the future to uh, put forward uh, solutions, uh, see how Jewish studies can survive in the context, first of all, of the new Bologna Accords in, uh, in Europe that tend to merge all fields of, uh, of knowledge, and, uh, which can be very good, but also Jewish uh, studies uh, as such uh, losing identity. Uh, and then there is the main issue of the lack of students for this uh, minor uh, specialty and the big word these days, uh, financing. Uh, as uh, maybe in other parts of the world, uh, researchers and uh, lecturers, uh, we are getting more and more involved in finding money and uh, at the end of the day, uh, I wonder if we will all become businessmen and businesswomen. <laughs> and uh, because, uh, well, it, it's a very difficult situation. So again, my congratulations for finding all the money to raise all the funds for this, because I know uh, we all go through this process and it's very difficult to do it. And uh, well, now coming to the topic of this talk, of, since there were already a few people who are going to talk about grammar, I decided to take uh, a view from the outside and uh, rather than going into uh, <coughs> linguistic treatises, I thought, so, well, I could give a, an overview of uh, a more general topic of linguistic attitudes or <coughs> of uh, language use among Karaites and see if uh, we can find anything specific about Karaism. And uh, I must say, I myself have come through different opinions, and uh, well, uh, I would like uh, to, to discuss about this with you, because um, it's, uh, I mean, my, uh, my paper is oriented uh, to uh, posing more questions than actually giving any answers. Uh, if I uh, try to think of uh, 
previous scholarship in the topic, uh, apart from the very well-known studies by uh, Irene Zvip, uh, mother of language and revelation, of course, although she didn't have all the materials that we have nowadays, there is uh, to the seminal work by Judith also Wish Langer, uh, Cara Linguistics, and now, um, and these two, in my opinion, are the main contributions to the field of uh, language use and linguistic attitudes among Karaites. Uh, before that, um, uh, we cannot uh, really trace a, a, a field of study, uh, first of all, because uh, uh, this area uh, was uh, born with social linguistics and modern uh, philosophy of language, so the terminology and the discipline as such did not exist in general, and uh, so it couldn't be applied uh, to Karais or to Ravanites. Um, in, a, in a very similar way as uh, if I think of Judeo-Arabic studies to uh, the phenomena that nowadays we can interpret and we can read in the light of modern uh, linguistics were not read in the same way in the past because the very field of social linguistics did not exist and uh, the concept of Jewish languages or Muslim languages uh, did not exist. And, uh, uh, for instance, if, uh, if we come to the Hirschfeld's uh, uh, edition and translation of several uh, Judeo-Arabic texts, and I think uh, here we have most of us used it uh, for finding some uh, texts by Karaites, and uh, uh, there we find, for instance, his uh, explanation of why uh, Jews wrote in Hebrew characters <coughs> that, in his opinion, uh, had to be explained in the context of uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the fact that Jews were using square characters uh, before they actually adopted the Arabic script. And uh, that uh, it would uh, seem to us more uh, of an exotic view than rather uh, is a, a view of uh, how we interpret nowadays the factor of script in social linguistics in general and in Jewish languages. And the sciences of language, uh, notably grammar and lexicography, can arguably be considered a crucial element in the development of medieval Jewish and Muslim thought. It is well known, however, that the main reason <coughs> for these two disciplines to enjoy uh, this high status among the Muslim and Jews was not derived from their intrinsic, intrinsic characteristics but from their role as auxiliary disciplines for the correct interpretation of the sacred text. As we all know, it is a, a grammar is, uh, uh, tends to be used as a tool for exegesis, and not only to be used as such, but to be perceived as an auxiliary uh, discipline of the main field of exegesis. And in this way, it is uh, put forward by several important exegetes who in the list of uh, uh, disciplines and, uh, and not, uh, capacities and kinds of skills that the uh, exegete should have, they always bring uh, linguistic terms uh, as some of the key uh, fact, uh, elements for the interpretation. So, not surprisingly, general reflections about language uh, were very few in the context of linguistic literature whose main tenet was, as I said, to help elucidating the text of the Bible in the Quran. We may, though, find scattered references inside grammatical and lexicographical works, and above all, in their introductions. It is in the introduction where we usually learn about the author's viewpoint on the discipline, and uh, it comes usually accompanied by the praise of the language to be studied. Uh, either Arabic if it is a Muslim grammarian or Hebrew. And uh, you have an example here in uh, one in the handout in the second page, for instance, the introduction by Yona Ibn Janah. I'm not going to get into that at the moment, but uh, this is an example of how we can find information about views on language in uh, when the author, uh, in that preliminary step before uh, getting into the subject, uh, 
comments on what he wants to do, what discipline is he ascribed to, and his views of the language. In some cases, it can be just a list of topos. Uh, uh, Arabic or Hebrew, if it is the case, it is the most beautiful language, the language chosen by God, the most perfect language, but it can also provide uh, more personal insights of the author, uh, as it is probably the case here uh, in the introduction to the Kitab Tankir by Ibn Janakh. The other main source of information of beliefs and perceptions about language is actually exegetical treatises, as uh, one might expect. Um, in this sense, uh, uh, the verse of uh, Genesis 2, uh, 19 that you have here in your handout is normally uh, the, uh, the place where commentators of the Bible uh, bring up their theories about language. Uh, so. So out of the ground, it says, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man <coughs> to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And uh, I brought here also what could be considered parallel uh, Muslim um, a, a verse from the Quran, in God taught Adam all the names. In, uh, it is, uh, as I said, uh, from the commentary of, of Genesis where we can uh, come across uh, those general reflections about language. Uh, this is the case of, uh, uh, of uh, Yehuda uh, Abul Farad uh, Furkan, for instance, when uh, in a very famous uh, passage uh, commenting on this specific verse, he uh, uh, proposes his theory of the origins of Hebrew by saying that uh, there were two uh, human creatures and um, one of them pointed, and he uses the term ishara, uh, that's very uh, relevant in all this kind of literature, the pointing to the object, the ishara, and uh, said even, uh, uh, stone, and the other person agrees, and from that moment onwards they call stone even. Uh, showing as well the arbitrary character that he believes uh, exists between uh, significant and significant, the, the word and the denotata. And uh, it is uh, in Islam the same role as, uh, is played by this Quranic verse in which God teaches Adam all the names. Uh, there is a very uh, well known. Uh, Muslim scholar, uh, Abdel Jabbar, a uh, Mu'tazila scholar, for instance, who uh, extensively comments on this verse and uh, the general idea of God as a name giver, as derived from, from this particular verse and the implications that it can have for the whole theological view of the Mu'tazilas. And I will come to that later. So from what I have just said, it, it is obvious that that medieval Judaism and Islam shared an important number of characteristics in the way uh, that these issues were handled, uh, of, uh, I mean issues of uh, general linguistic character. The ground for coincidence is the common fact of having a sacred scripture that was revealed in specific linguistic format, that is, in a specific language. Uh, that was chosen by God, uh, we assume, for transmitting his message. And this, uh, but in the case of Judaism, this shared language and themes with Islam is not just uh, a, parallel, uh, a parallel development, but uh, we also have to, uh, uh, to, see, to see it as the result of the influence of Islam on contemporary Judaism, both Rabbanite and Karaite since both branches of Judaism were deeply embedded in the Arabo-Muslim milieu at least until the 13th century. So the question is, is there, and what is it, if it exists, uh, anything specific about charism in regard, I'm not talking about grammar here, but about perceptions of language and linguistic attitudes. In, um, uh, 
in grammar, clearly, there, is, uh, there, there are some theories that were only contemplated by Harais, and uh, I think in that sense, uh, Nadia is uh, going to give a, a very nice overview. But uh, how about the perception, the concept of language? And um, there are a few uh, traits and developments that are generally considered as specific of medieval Harais. The first one is the fact that there was a revival of the Hebrew language in the early period of Karaism as a phenomenon related to Karaite ideology about Hebrew. And uh, this, uh, as far as I know, it was Judith also which Langwer who first uh, um, proposed uh, this idea of uh, that uh, use of Hebrew in the early treatises of uh, Karaites uh, motivated by, uh, po made possible because their idea about language was not as among Rabbanites, and I hope I'm interpreting her correctly, it was not as in the case of Rab uh, Rabbanites, uh, such a holy language that could not be used for profane subjects. And uh, so in this sense, uh, Judith uh, believes that uh, uh, using Hebrew for uh, contracts or all that kind of uh, of writing was possible for, for this reason because uh, they, they had less prejudices, let's say, for employing the holy language in a non-religious uh, matter. And uh, well, it, it is a question that we can discuss uh, in a minute. But uh, there is another revival of the Hebrew language in the Middle Ages, Middle Ages but in this case, it happens among Rabbanites. And uh, as uh, you will know, uh, it had place in, the, in Al Andalus, in Muslim Spain, in the 10th and 11th centuries. So, how do we uh, then correlate uh, the two Hebrew revivals? In this case, um, it might seem contradictory, but it is not, and uh, it could it reinforce uh, uh, also with theories because the revival of the Hebrew language in Spain did not uh, was not for uh, a profane subjects, even though it was for secular subjects. But it is different. Um, but it was used in the domain of poetry, as you know, because uh, it was understood that Hebrew mm. was the highest, uh, the most aesthetic language in the language that could convey all the values of uh, beauty for such a creative and artistic uh, enterprise as was poetry considered in the Middle Ages. And also as a result of the competition with, uh, with, Mus uh, with Arab Muslim poets and with that uh, milieu in Al-Andalus who is doing more for his sacred language. And, um, so it could be, it could actually, as I said, even though it has never been compared, I think the two revivals can be seen in the same light, and it could, uh, in that sense, that Hebrew was considered a, a special language, a language with aesthetic value, and uh, this is why Rabbanites in the in Al Andalus uh, gave it a new life. But even though it was for secular uh, poems, not religious poems, it always uh, had that uh, air of being uh, the most valued art of the time, poetry. Uh, the other, uh, um, the other uh, aspect that is considered to be special about Karaites is the transcriptions of the Bible into Arabic script that, as far as, I, uh, as we know, uh, Rabbanites never did. And, uh, well, this uh, phenomenon has been largely uh, commented upon by Jeffrey Kahn, <coughs> Bahal Gai Ben Shammai, among others. But uh, uh, it seems to me really that this is uh, something uh, unique in that we can also consider the transcriptions of the Bible into the Arabic script as uh, special, as uh, a differentiating trait of uh, Karaites. And uh, even though the interpretations may vary, it can be seen as, uh, uh, as only a way of making it more familiar for Jews because they could be more used to Arabic script <coughs> or as you can come, uh, suggest uh, because it was a way of transmitting the reading the correct pronunciation of the Hebrew text. 
and third, uh, it, it has uh, it is always uh, uh, said that uh, what is cara, uh, what is special about uh, Karaism <coughs> theorems, about language and in general, is that a rationalistic view. And uh, this can be uh, seen very clearly in theories of the origin of language, even though uh, the rationalist view uh, applies also to other aspects of uh, language concepts, such as the relationship between the word and the thing that has been named, whether it is arbitrary or natural, etc. But really, theories on the origin of language can give a lot of ground for uh, discussion in this sense. And, uh, and, uh, well, during the Middle Ages, as uh, I have said before, Rabbanite Jews uh, had traditionally held beliefs about the holiness of Hebrew, and that was believed to be of divine origin, uh, primarily the means of communication between God and his angels, and later revealed to Adam that in, <coughs> from that moment on, who became the first and unique language of humanity until the fall of Babel. This is more or less what says in Bereshit Rabbah. Karaite authors uh, adopted more slight views uh, in their reflection of the nature of language. <coughs> language originated accor according uh, to most Karaite scholars as an agreement between men who chose specific sounds to express reality, as I said, in an arbitrary way. And I would like now to come to uh, the <coughs> quotation of the Kitab al uh, uh, the in the first page. Uh, it's, uh, I read, uh, I quote, sir. Know that when rational beings felt the need to understand the intentions of each other and to communicate, and to communicate their desires, they reach language by an agreement, al istilah since its adoption was more simple and it was easier, easier to interpret than other actions. And, uh, well, uh, uh, I don't know if Professor Maman, you have probably read this in the Mustami, because after this, uh, the, the author changes the subject. So this is uh, the quotation uh, isolated because he does not continue talking about this, but about something else. And it could be uh, a little difficult to interpret. What does he mean by <clears throat> its adoption was more simple and it was easier to interpret than other, uh, than other actions? Well, uh, then we come again to the, Muslim, uh, uh, to the Muslim milieu because there is an almost identical quotation from Abde, Abdel Jabbar in uh, the Mu'tazilite scholar in his famous al muhmit and uh, Abdel Jabbar uh, deals with this, with this question as well. He says, why men chose speech, kalam, for the particular purpose of their agreement? Movements, he says, uh, harakat, and uh, deeds, afal, could play the same function and serve for the basis of agreement, muwala. But Abdel Jabbar, Abdel Jabbar does not reject this possibility, it could be, but then he claims, but Kalam was chosen because it offered more possibilities. Also, Baban Mingairihi, and it gave a vast range of forms. Moreover, it makes the use of other means superfluous. And uh, it is uh, then uh, clear the interconnection and the influence of uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim in, in Jews in this particular uh, question. Uh, if we come uh, to the uh, on, on the back on the verse of your handout, I'm just going to read uh, two of these quotations, and then if you wish, we can comment on the rest. Uh, the process of naming that I'm going to read in the English translation uh, by Jeffrey Kahn, also referring to this particular uh, subject. The word naming, tasmiya, refers to the activity of somebody who gives names, just as the word arranging, tasmiya, refers to the activity of somebody who arranges. Those who name things belong to one of two categories. One of these is the people of the language, and the other is the lawgiver, the exalted one. Common agreement with regard to language is a necessity 
whereas common agreement may not exist with regard to law, since law is not based on convention. When rational beings became conscious of things, they gave a name to each one of them that referred directly to it and distinguished it from others in speech. <coughs> if necessary, they subsequently extended this usage or employed some type of metaphor, majas, with the result that the scope of the nouns usage went beyond what was originally established for it. Uh, he keeps on talking about metaphorical use, so I'm not uh, reading it. And also the, the next quotation, uh, the, uh, on perceptions of the in, uh, in which uh, I think uh, Abul Farad does uh, something uh, very original, uh, for, especially for this period. Uh, because even though uh, naming and this process of naming had been dealt with with other authors and uh, by Muslim authors especially, uh, what Abul Farad uh, does here is to distinguish um, between uh, he goes far uh, beyond uh, naming and talks about linguistic structure in all languages, also as established by convention, grammar established by convention. Uh, I quote: uh, Take note that the basic meaning that is expressed by the conjoining of nouns, he's talking about the idafa, is the conjoining of a possession to a possessor in the literal sense. When people perceived that things were possessed and that their possessors had more right to them than people who were not their possessors, they said things like, uh, uh, this is the house of Zaid, to distinguish it from the house of Amr. After this practice had become had been established among them, they conjoined other things one to the other, although it did not constitute possession in the literal sense, and no true act of possession was exercised by the item to which the other item was conjoined. Rather, they are existed between the conjoined item and the item to which the conjoining was made, an affiliation and a connection that did not exist between them. And some other, uh, between them and some other item to which no conjoining is made. They use the construction following the model of conjoining of a possession to its possessor and said, in such circumstances, things such as the citadel of Aleppo and the lighthouse of Alexandria on account of an affiliation, etc. The process that has taken place among intellectual people, both Arabs and non-Arabs, without it being exclusive to one people of the language rather than the other, has taken place. This is because it is in origin a perception of the intellect and not something established by convention. It is, if this were not the case, it could differ in different languages as the nature of things established by convention. So he's uh, talking about a universal grammar in a very uh, chomsky uh, sense of the existence of a language common, common to all human beings that is then materialized into different languages. And I think uh, uh, this is uh, very unique uh, about the, in the thought of Abul Farad Harun that uh, I have not found in other uh, a, a Muslim or Jewish uh, grammarians of the period. And please correct me, you have uh, data I, I don't know. Uh, so it, it's very clear, uh, I think in these two quotations, and there are many others, that rationalistic view that has been usually uh, claimed for Karais in the views of language. But didn't rationalist views exist among Rabbanites? Uh, if I can think, for instance, of the case of Saadi Gaon, and there we can also find references, clear references, to language universals and also to a man, Adam in this case, as developing language after he, is, uh, he gets the faculty of language from God. But it is also a human creation in the sense that it is Adam, that Sadia uh, calls the institutor of language, who develops the human language. And, uh, and he's a uh, foremost uh, Rabbanite scholar, even though it doesn't go as far as, uh, as Abul Farad. But um, in my opinion, uh, we may hear, at least in this particular case, uh, be, uh, we may see Abul Farad as uh, 
as the representative of all Karaite uh, views on language, and it might not be the case, in fact. And uh, that uh, uh, Saadia could also develop these rationalistic views is very, uh, is very telling in that sense, because they were all under the influence, uh, Rabbanite and Karaite, under the influence of the Muslim Kalamid of the Mu'attasilite school of thought. I would like to uh, come to a conclusion, so maybe we can comment on uh, other aspects. Um, uh, because, in my opinion, the new directions uh, for the future, uh, in the analysis of the already existing text that we have, and in the new text that could give information about uh, this particular aspect, is, uh, first of all, to uh, consider the interplay with other disciplines and more specifically with the usul al-fiqh and with the terminology of the, of the uh, Muslim legal school. Because even, I didn't go into detail, but the terminology that we find in all these uh, writings is taken from the, uh, not so much from grammar or from linguistic uh, ideas, but actually from the usul al-fiqh and from uh, Mu'attasil uh, scholars in particular. And I would also uh, like to pose the, um, to bring the idea of considering the regional factor as an element of differentiation. Since uh, a, a Saadi, as I said, and other Robinette scholars in the, uh, in the Orient were also, also held similar views, I think uh, we could also uh, bring uh, the question to a more oriental, uh, a western or an eastern school of thought that is a group of scholars that were under the same kind of uh, influences and were doing similar readings. And um, I think I'll finish here. And uh, maybe we can, uh, we can comment uh, the text uh, if you wish. Thank you. features, um, for example, so you translate uh, mm -hmm. Ilham as uh, revelation, in, uh, in, my opinion, in my opinion it should be translated as uh, mm -hmm. yeah, inspiration rather, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and which is, uh, of course, revelation is what? In, uh, in Arabic, which you uh, translate as uh, uh, revelation, uh, <coughs> so we can see how translation is <laughs> well, difficult, yeah. yes, yes, especially yes, yes, in such kind of things. Thank you. No, thank you for thank you for your remarks on the second program. Yes. Uh, yeah. Also, it is true that pragmatics uh, again as a uh, but pragmatics is also part of uh, the new developments of ling relatively new developments of linguistics, of course. Too. Thank you. But it may provide uh, yes. you some tools. Uh, yeah, to a methodological framework. Like That's right, a methodological framework of uh, modern linguistics. Yeah. Well, I didn't... Uh.
No, 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 you go ahead. Just Please. side regarding the question of uh, holiness of the language. Um, as far as I uh, recall, Rabbi Yonah Ibn Janah believed that Aramaic too was uh, a holy language. Mm -hmm. And the reason he gives is that uh, some chapters in the Bible are written in Aramaic. Is all in the... And also mm -hmm. the morphophonology of both languages are quite close to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you compare that to Arabic, yeah. for instance. Yeah, there is, is more similarity between yeah, the two. So, yeah, that's right. So the question is, what is holy? What is the holiness of, of a language? Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. What is the holiness of, of a language? Uh, is, uh, the Rambam says that Lashon uh, HaKodesh uh, in Hebrew is, is holy because it doesn't have a term for, um, you know, for the genetic uh, uh, oh, uh, organs. It's amazing. Yeah, so, so even the rabbis uh, uh, disagree uh, regarding the question in what language, what language Adam Arishon uh, really spoke. This might be Aramaic rather than Hebrew. So, but also if you combine. The, the idea of the Torah was given to people in the language they speak and they, they understand. So it makes the question of holiness secondary. So it was rather a practical uh, idea that made uh, Hebrew uh, Kodesh than something essential. So just to give some ideas about it. What is honest regarding the language? Yeah, I think uh, maybe because we establish so many comparisons with Arabic, that is very clearly a secret language uh, with no hesitation on the part of Muslim scholars. So we, uh, we tend to exaggerate, uh, let's put it that way, rabbinite ideas about the holiness of uh, Hebrew. But uh, yeah, probably for that parallelism with uh, uh, Arabic as being the language that. Uh, God in the Quran says that this, he, the language he has actually chosen for transmitting his message. And uh, yeah, probably we uh, we go too far in that uh, comparison. It is not so much the case. And uh, uh, at least uh, it was not always uh, like that in, in among Romanites, the holiness of people. I'm thinking, I'm listening to your uh, talk. Um, I'm re I really don't know much about uh, grammarian uh, uh, treatises, but anyway, and, and, that, and a question that Danny was asking before is like in my head, and you were talking about um, his uh, Chomsky and almost approach to, to linguistics. So the question is, is, is this something unique, Karaite, or is, is this something that was out there? Um, you mm -hmm. know, in, in, so, well, as far as I know, it is unique of Abul Farad. It is. It, the, the, the idea of the universal grammar. Is, so would you say this is a character uh, uh, approach, or this is his approach? No, because, uh, well, uh, you correct me if you know more than me. But uh, no, because there are, our, there are very rationalistic uh, statements about language on the part of other scholars. Uh, Yeshua ben uh, the disciple of um, Abul Faraj Harun, that is Abul Faraj Furkan, for instance. Uh, but uh, uh, more focus on the process of naming, of giving names. Now, going um, to that abstract category of thinking of uh, grammar uh, as a universal concept for all languages, I only. Uh, Ex express in that uh, explicit way, uh, I only know Abul Farad uh, for that. And uh, even though uh, Saadia Gaon also has a few um, references to uh, grammar in that universal sense, uh, uh, languages in general, but not expressed in this way, uh, su such a clear statement. So I would say this this is unique of Abul Farad. But, uh, well, yeah. Um, I don't see much evidence for the, the revival of the Hebrew language in early terrorism as far as, being, as it being used as a, as a 
the language. I mean, after the first generation of Tanyuak, when you see, mm -hmm. and then they all start writing in Arabic. Mm. Yeah. And in so, Judea, yeah. yeah. So, you know, in, in Spain, they were writing poetry in Hebrew, but what, what else were they writing in Hebrew? Uh, in the Arabic, in the, uh, in the Arabic Muslim, uh, under Muslim rule. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, in the late Middle Ages, uh, Hebrew starts to become again. Uh, yeah. 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 But uh, in this context, this context of. But you're talking uh, about the early, the yeah. early stage in this. Early, you talked about this early uh, no, revival of Hebrew. Mm -hmm. No, after that uh, revival. Uh, uh, it is mostly Judeo-Arabic, uh, mm -hmm. the, the widespread language for science. And, uh, you have yeah, Benjamin and Aula and Lee, you have uh, Saban bin Rukim and the Belchalot HaShem, mm -hmm. and you have some of the, some of the texts that uh, Pinsker published, some of the uh, uh, polemic, the missionary texts are in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Well, also the, all the contracts that Judith also this longer uh, Edited, and uh, I mean, mm -hmm. some uh, kind of legal contracts uh, as well remained also in Hebrew throughout the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think in that case, the explanation is really because there was already uh, a pattern of document right. that was easier to follow mm -hmm. in the language that has been transmitted mm -hmm. rather than improvising mm -hmm. a new language. For mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. there's a indicate to what that's uh, all in Hebrew. Also, the, this, I mean, can we make a oh, conversation? Is that, is that okay? Because it will be easier. I mean, a, another issue there when we think about comparing it to the Spanish case or, or whether they really did have some kind of ideology is that they don't talk about it. I mean, that's the interesting thing. It's not like in Spain where you actually, the one who does talk about it is Sadia at that period. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't right. see Karaites in that period talking about it. So that's also why it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to explain their motivation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, just, uh, well, it's a very sort of nice uh, overview. So thank you, Mary, of, of the. But the, the main point I'd like to make is that, um, particularly for people who are not sort of in the field of Karaite grammar, is that it's very. We have to remember that um, Karaite grammar developed in leaps, and there are some very distinct stages in its development. And, and Abu Farage, I mean, I probably wrongly sort of referred to this as the sort of classical period of Arabic called Karaite grammar. In fact, it's rather unique. I mean, Abu Faraj is quite unique within the sort of the field of the, the, the Karaite grammarians. And in fact, um, it was, um, when we're trying to get a handle it, sort of talk about, <coughs> you know, sort of general issues about the whole question of Karaite grammatical tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something which, uh, Nadia and I will talk about at the, the end of the conference, about more of the, sort of the origins, but I think, I think it's very important to take into account beyond, you know, we, this is, you know, a sort of rather unique sort of attitude of Abel Farage, and this is Abel Farage, and it's not sort of representing Karaite tradition in general, because there was a very different yes. tradition that came before it. Um, and um, the, the, I mean, the other sort of general point about the Hebrew language, I mean, the, you know, it was a sort of couple of things, just like I said, because there's, there's of course, it was quite, um, in that period, about the 9th century, early 10th century, there was this, you know, there was quite a general use of Hebrew, you know, also by rabbinites in the East. Um, and um, the, I mean, you see it very nicely in the sort of the whole field of Masoretic activity, because mm -hmm. you get, you know, you get the Masoretic notes are written in Aramaic, but by the time we get into the 9th, early 10th century, we get Masoretic treatises being written in Hebrew. And then when we get into the mid 10th century, they start being written in Arabic. So you get the sort of, in a sense, that is a very nice sort of representation of, of how sort of linguistic attitudes mm -hmm. developed. It's yeah. a very chronological thing. It's not an issue of sort of a sudden revival of Hebrew, though it's always there. Mm -hmm. it's somehow it's very much, again, you have to think of getting things in the right sort of chronology here, you know, I think. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, I'd just like to pay tribute to Rina Droy, who was sadly, was, uh, she died very prematurely, but I, I've, I've always had a great deal of respect for her work. I mean, it, some parts have been rather controversial. I, I was just rereading it, actually, on the plane coming here. <laughs> In fact, um, some of the things she was she's saying, I think, really are very valid regarding the only attitude of 
carry out to language. And one of the things, of course, she, I mean, her main thesis was, of course, that um, Karaj was very much influenced by Arabic environments and applying a lot of models of this Islamic environment to, to Judaism. But one of the, 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 the things she was uh, uh, had, had discussed was the issue about how much the, the sort of the, the Muslim attitude to language regate, relating specifically to the purity of language, the ijaz, and the issue of mm -hmm. the fact that the Quraysh, the notion that the language of the Quraysh was the purest, and how, um, what is the sort of most reliable source for establishing, um, you know, the pure language, and, and you know, the, according to the Muslim tradition, one had to go out into the street, in, into the desert, mm -hmm. and, and find the Bedouin. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a, a, a lot of that, um, sort of, not probably not directly, I mean, Karak's not referring to going to talk to the Bedouin, exactly, but I mean, you do get references to some of their attitudes, I think, very much are in the spirit. I mean, and this is, I think, is perhaps behind their, one of the possibilities of, of, of why they were uh, transcribing Arabic, okay. describing Bibles into, into Arabic script, is that I think, I mean, the, the point here is that what they are transcribing is actually the Quray, the reading tradition, the living reading mm -hmm. tradition. We have to remember that at that period, the 10th century, early 11th century, the, certainly the Tiberian reading tradition was still alive, mm -hmm. and they were transcribing a live tradition. And they certainly, are, mm -hmm. I mean, Elphil Kassani uh, says this explicitly, that, you know, this is, uh, it's just, this is the most reliable sort of uh, authoritative source. If you talk, not, not just the Bible, the Bible's various layers, you've got the, you've got the actual written text, the Ketiv, so you've also got the reading, which is alive, mm -hmm. and that is what they were transcribing. And, um, you know, in a, so in a sense, this was almost the living tradition, which mm -hmm. was very, the pure living tradition, which was corresponding to this sort of the pure living tradition of the, of the Quraysh. So, I mean, I think, um, uh, so that's a sort of fact. And then, again, this, is the, this has developed through the, uh, the sort of, Muslim environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A related uh, question, or maybe point for discussion. Um, Abu Farid Harun seems to be one of the stars of the next few days. Though it's very interesting to think about also what he was reading. Because also, I like you, Marichal, I think it's really important to, um, he so often says in Kitab al-Kafi that you have to, well, this is really a a discussion related to usul al-fiqh, so I'm just going to say this small bit and I'm not going to discuss it anymore. Yeah. But it's it's very interesting to consider what was he reading. Uh -huh. And it's he's so, when he writes, he's, he's so opaque and he doesn't quote the sources. You don't know names, you don't know titles, but it seems very clear that he was very well steeped in um, the Arabic literary tradition in many genres. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be interesting if we could try to, at some point, figure out what, what he was reading exactly that was informing yeah, these well, discussions. Yeah, well, it's clearly even a Sarraj, so that was Nasir Basson mm -hmm. claimed, and uh, I see lots of similarities with Abdel Jabbar, too. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's, uh, that's something that uh, could be a project for us in the future to but identify sources. I think, but I think, I think that the point is even more fundamental that the fact that he was reading. What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, there might seem a bit, this is a bit of extreme, but he was reading texts. I mean, in the previous period, in, in, you know, in the, in the previous generation, far more was going on in the school room orally. There were sort of discussions which were oral discussions. But Abu Faraj was, this is the time of the Dalil Ilm in Jerusalem, with a library, you know, and he was actually reading books. And this is why we can trace some of the texts, mm -hmm. Saraj, of course. But it's not a trivial point. I mean, this is part of the reason there's a sudden leap mm -hmm. in this period. He suddenly was Karaite started to read. Mm -hmm. It was a period of the transition from morality, more of an oral type of culture where people simply just discuss things in the majlis, mm -hmm. to a time when they sat down in the library. And this is when this is the great the time of where all the intellectual sort of currents in Mu'tazilism mm -hmm. sort of flowed into the sort of uh, Karaite culture. Mm -hmm.
Well, of course, it is reflected in the language that uh, he's not using as uh, even more kalu, uh, wakalu, in uh, reflecting that uh, environment of discussion, oral discussion among uh, people, because he's not really uh, quoting us with this kalu or kalu. It's larger than. Oh, nothing. Um, I just wanted to go back to your remark about. Um, how language attitudes were locally determined, yeah. how Karaites had a rationalistic approach to language and Saadi had it, and it's all in the same area. Mm. Um, just to clarify, are you then saying that uh, this, um, the language attitudes are not specifically Karaites, but rather locally determined, and that maybe what is specifically Karaites about the language attitude is how much they were influenced by the Mu'tazila. So what's special about this attitude is the influence that Mu'tazila had over it rather than yes. well, uh, well, I'm suggesting, I'm not stating, but I think, uh, yes, uh, if you read uh, Saadi, I was reading uh, lately the Dotan's edition, and there are lots of uh, statements that are so rationalistic in Saudi Gaon and that can be traced as well to Muslim theology or Muslim uh, uh, kalam. And uh, so I, I, I wonder uh, if uh, really it was something specifically Karite or uh, the views of Abul Faraj were just, as we said, Abul Faraj's views and they were unique about him. And then there was a general rationalistic approach to language in uh, in that area, in among those communities of Judaism, because they were under the same uh, kind of uh, influence and they were doing the same uh, uh, readings. I, I suggest, yes. I am not stating, but I, I think it could be the case. Um, would you though say that it was? Uh, Specific for Karais to be more influenced than Mu'tazila? <laughs> to be more, uh, but uh, who can we compare with apart from Saadi Agon? I don't. Uh, uh, I think uh, I would try to avoid uh, general statements. That's uh, the thing uh, I think I've come to as a conclusion because uh, as uh, we read more and know more about contemporary. Uh, uh, what other contemporary scholars write, then we can uh, we can make a general statement more clearly it, that Karaites were very influenced by Mu'tazilites is very clear to all of us. Uh, but uh, what can we compare it with then in the same area? Because um, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the realm of grammar because the influence of Mu'tazilites can mm. probably be traced in other areas just as well. And it's theology. probably, well, even more than <laughs> theology. So, um, could we look at other areas and say that Karaites are so specifically influenced by Mu'tazila mm -hmm. and say why specifically Karaites are so influenced? Uh, that's but also an idea out of, out of ignorance a little bit because theology is <laughs> slightly outside of my... <laughs> No, that, that's, uh, no that, that's a very interesting issue that we have to investigate. Also, there is the question of the Greek trans, of the trans, translation of the Aristotelian texts uh, that were uh, circulating, and uh, whether uh, Karais were reading straight the Arabic translations or they were uh, um, reading them through uh, Muatasilite interpretation. So, my my guess. Here is that it comes from Mu'atasilite uh, uh, text because uh, they use the same terminology. The, the, in the case of uh, Abdel Jabbar, it's so clear, almost uh, same statements about language. But uh, maybe, again, it is only Abu Faraj and other authors, other Karai scholars, were uh, had access to the translation of the Greek text. Uh, without going through Islam. Okay, I think we basically have to stop. And I'd only uh, add this comment in terms of rationalism. This was an accusation 
tossed around both by the Muslim observers of Karaz and Rabbinism and by the Karaites and Rabbinites themselves as to who was more rationalistic and the Karaite accusation of the Rabbinites because of Midrashim, because of the Shiva Koma uh, and other uh, corporeal, corporeal statements about God, that they were the rash, irrationalists and the Karaites tried to present themselves as the rationalists. But among the, uh, the Rabbinites, there certainly are different parties. And I think David's uh, book on the Shmuel ben Chofni Gaon uh, showed, try to give a, a, a taxonomy of the different various groups in the Jewish community, I think which include probably the Karaites as well as the Rabbinites in terms of the, the very rationalists, the moderate rationalists, the anti-rationalists, whatever. The thing is, the problem is the, the lack of sources. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.